Okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about receptors and maybe try to clarify uh, to those for whom it doesn't seem very clear yet what they do and how they actually work and the impact, you know, the part they actually play, what a large part it actually is. So first, um, let me come up with a few simple examples of receptors and how they kind of work uh, so you can get a very, very rough idea of what I'm talking about if you need this kind of uh, elementary description or explanation. So let's try. Um, all right, how about hay fever, people who suffer from hay fever? Um, what happens is they breathe in uh, pollen, and various substances and molecules that the body identifies as pathogens, correctly or incorrectly identifies as pathogens, and so stimulates an immune-related response, which is the production of histamine. Then that histamine has to bind to a receptor. Receptors are made of protein, they are proteins that are usually, for all we need to really talk about right now, on the exterior cell wall. And they're kind of just like um, a wall socket. And whatever is going to uh, bind in them, it has to be a specific agent that will specifically is designed to fit into sort of like a key and a lock to that specific receptor. It would kind of be like a lamp like the plug on the cord of a lamp, you plug it into an outlet. Well, the receptor's made of protein. It's kind of like a, you know, the plug, an outlet, right? Open, empty outlet. So that's required for this plug to come over and plug into, kind of like a key into a lock. And when the key fits into the lock, it turns, let's just say, and opens up a, a vault of different reactions uh, inside of that cell. Or what it actually is, receptors are the eyes and ears, more or less, of a cell. And when something that is designed or by nature uh, created to fit into that receptor, it plugs into it, it activates it like a key into a lock, and that uh, turns on, it's like a toggle switch on and off, that turns on various reactions within that cell. And then that cell, based on on this switch, turning it on, will go ahead and uh, follow different instructions and act in a myriad of different ways depending on what we're considering. Or, or it remains uh, inactive, unactivated, and just sits there, right, if it doesn't get the stimulation of the key in the lock. So, like something with hay fever, for instance, you breathe in some molecules that, particles that the body deems are a pathogen, either correctly or incorrectly, responds by producing histamine. Histamine can bind to what they know of one of four various receptors, appropriately enough entitled H1, H2, H3, and H4. H1 is usually um, the receptor. When that's stimulated, this is kind of responsible for like uh, uh, itchiness, like you would get from an insect bite. Uh, a number of other kind of things like this. So that's why, you know, when it, when it binds the receptor, unlocks this key in the lock, and it creates these type of, the cell then is instructed to go ahead and carry out its, uh, um, carry out its, its order, uh, which it runs through its, its fucking list of shit that it does in response to this on-off switch being toggled on, right? Like turning a light on, well in this case you're turning it on and now you know, you get the itchiness from an insect bite or, you know, whatever have you. The runny nose, you know, the, the, the red eyes, the watery eyes, whatever. Um, something else would be like, uh, let's say, a drug. For instance, like tamoxifen citrate. How drugs bind to receptors. Let's say tamoxifen citrate, which some of you uh, may realize is a drug called Novodex. Uh, There's one name for it. It may be the name you're most familiar with if you're familiar with it at all. Now, Novodex is uh, what we consider a competitive inhibitor. What it does is um, it's prescribed for the use 
in breast cancer within males or females. And what it can do is normally the estrogen would bind to the specific receptor that's on the surface of this tumor, the cells of this tumor, and when it binds to it and it's stimulated by the activation of that estrogen binding to its receptor, then the tumor gets bigger, the tumor spreads. So what this is then, this competitive inhibitor, it's like a dummy key that's made to go in and block uh, block that lock off so now the estrogen cannot bind. So you still have the presence of the estrogen, but now when it goes there, that's one receptor that's already seen as occupied and it can't affect that cell. See how that works? Okay, so let's take it further now and say, uh, uh, so what part do drugs play? in receptors as far as susceptibility and what kind of um, success you might have in stimulating or uh, deactivating, blocking a receptor with a particular drug or hormone. Uh, that depends on the genetic predisposition and the genetic component is like in an endless amount. They don't even understand all of it yet. However, they have concluded that they're now, this is a broad estimate because they really have a very loose understanding of this. But when they're talking about pharmacology and drugs and how drugs in the medical community affect different patients, how do they know what drugs to use on whom? They believe that the drug's reaction is based 20 to 95 percent on the individual genetics of that patient. The genetic component can play a role of between 20 and 95 percent. So that's a wide spectrum. So they really don't have a great grasp on all of it yet, even to this date. But that should be enough so far, what I've described for you to figure out that if you don't have a whole bunch of receptors, or if for whatever reason the drug in question, the molecule in question, is unable to bind successfully to that receptor, then you won't get a response. You won't get a response, and that's why various drugs, you can have many different forms of a drug that's intended to have the same outcome, but one drug will work very well with a patient the same patient may take another drug in the same class, which may do almost nothing because the genetic component they believe or they estimate can play a factor of between 20 and 95% uh, of the susceptibility rate for that patient to respond to that particular drug or hormone. So this is why now when you take this and you think about it, some people... A guy like Boston Lloyd, who rumor has it, has, according to Blaha the Hut, he cites that Boston Lloyd has admitted to, and I don't know this, I haven't seen Boston Lloyd admit to it because I, I, don't really, I do find him entertaining somewhat, but I, I and I think he's general, gen, general, generally probably a decent kid, but I haven't seen him admit this, I haven't seen it come out of his mouth, but allegedly... Blaha the Hutt says that he's admitted to taking upwards of 14 grams of anabolics a week. 14 grams. Think about how much that is. You know how much that is? To me, that sounds like instantaneous death. Now, I know there's a lot of busters out there that want to say that pro bodybuilders and even, you know, really big guys take a ton of shit, unbelievable amount of shit, and then lie about it. I'm telling you what, to me, the even just the concept of anybody taking 14 grams of shit, that sounds to me like death. That sounds, I can't even believe that. So I can't even fathom that. All the years I have in this, and I can't even fathom that. You know, many years of my life I've been around all of this. I can't imagine that. Then that's 100% God's honest truth. 
So I don't know that that's true. I can't imagine any human being could do that. I, I think that's just death. I don't see how that can happen, but I don't know. Unless maybe the guy has like almost no receptors. I don't know. And then on the other end, you have a guy like uh, Blaha the Hutt, who now he's allegedly alluding uh, to the reality that he's between 500 and 700 migs a week. And again, this is another guy. Even at that relatively minuscule amount compared to 14 grams, I would say that looking at that body it's produced, it discredits everything he says uh, on related topics. It discredits everything he says because even that amount, 500 to 700 migs a week, and to look like that, I don't know what he would look like without that then. What would he turn into a woman? I'm not sure. But that's still ridiculous. So I'm just trying to give you some idea of perspective here. And the other thing I'm just trying to, to uh, share with you is the reality that genetic predisposition, right, uh, is greatly going to influence your susceptibility to any of these things that you take, you put in your body. Anything from if you have hay fever all the way to, you know, various allergies and triggers for said allergies, all the way to, um, you know, all kind of prescribed medications and even the hormones that are in your body. So a guy could have plenty of testosterone naturally in his body. He could be high on the scale if they tested him. But if the poor bastard doesn't have the receptors, there's no place for it to bind. Now, of course, he's going to have some, right? And then the androgen factor can be separated from the anabolic component. So it's, it's so many things at play here. So many things at play here. So one guy, would he do better on a pure anabolic as opposed to Something like test, which is a heavy androgen, um, you know, with, with some anabolic components still, but, or who knows? You know what I mean? It's, it's a genetic crapshoot, but it's, it's a huge factor. So when you look at some guys and you take a bunch of stuff and they, they still, they don't look like anything. To me, 14 grams, you should look like, I don't know. I don't know. You should look like some kind of mutated frigging 500 pound dead guy. You know, I don't know, but uh, even 500 to 700 migs in my experience, I just can't fathom that a guy would look like that, even with that, that dose. It's just ridiculous, and even more ridiculous to me is uh, the reality that people watch this and loan any credibility to somebody that... That that's the state of their, that that's, you know, they're 500 to 700 migs and look like that. I mean, it's ridiculous. And they're going to tell you that you can gain muscle just by sitting around and taking anabolics as opposed to somebody that lifts on a lower amount. This guy is delusional from the word go. From the word go, but we already know that. And the only reason I'm putting this out there isn't to hate on anybody. It's just because... Um, any potential busters in training out there, I don't want you to become a buster. Because there's no upside to it for you. There's no upside to it. And there's enough busters out there. So, let's keep it real. Um, if you have a one-room studio apartment, and for whatever reason, you only have three outlets there. You have three electrical outlets, and you cannot modify anything. You cannot add to that. You cannot splice off several extension cords. None of this nonsense. You have three outlets and so you want more light in the room, you have two lights plugged in there, and you go and buy a third light and plug it in. Is it going to be brighter now with three lights as opposed to two lights in operation? Yes. More light? Yes. Now what if you go and you still want it brighter, so you go buy two more lamps? Is it going to get any brighter in there? No. You only have three outlets, and you can't change that in any way, shape, or form. You can't alter that. You have three outlets and five lamps now, so two lamps can't plug in. So now if you still keep buying lamps, if you fill the room with lamps, will it be any brighter? 
won't be any brighter because you still can only plug in three. So that's all the brighter it's going to get. But what happens to all these other lamps? They're just sitting around cluttering shit up and causing problems. Understand? Think about it. They're in the way. You're tripping all over them. There's all kind of other shit. They're still in there. You can't... Just because they're not doing anything doesn't mean that they're not doing anything. If they're not doing what you wanted to do because there's nowhere to plug them in, but they're still doing things. They're in the way. They're underfoot. They're trip hazard and who knows what else, right? Okay, so that's it. Short and sweet. Receptors are what it's all about. And, you know, there's nothing that can be done about that to my knowledge. I suppose... Somewhere there's somebody who thinks you can do something about it. I don't know. But uh, that's the the, mo the biggest limiting factor truly is the genetic component, even in your susceptibility in response to anything that you take. Anything. Anything. Be it allergies or testosterone. 